motherhood, but not quite as we imagine. Thought-provoking, refreshing, straightforward, sometimes taboo. Often seemingly ordinary, but always honest. Welcome to School for Mothers, opening conversations we all need to have, exploring ways in which you can be fulfilled as a woman, once a mother. Now, here is your host, mother of 10, Danusha Melina Durban. Hello and welcome back to the School for Mothers podcast. I'm Danusha Melina Durban, your host. Let's dive into today's episode. Welcome to the School for Mothers podcast, Aurelie. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Well, thank you. I am pleased to be here and thank you for the invitation. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, you're one of the, from my recollection and also my readings, obviously I, I've done quite a bit of reading uh, on you. You're a key uh, writer on motherhood, aren't you, from an academic perspective? Oh, goodness. Um <laughs> I always let other people um, say that about me. I don't know, you know, as you know, as an academic too, if we, we can say that about ourselves, but it turns out that maybe at least what I stumbled upon is a good missing link. How's that? <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a lovely <laughs> way of saying probably yes. <laughs> well, you are. I mean, I, I know that one of the distinctions about your writing has to be surely that most writing about mothers is about their their mothering of others, their their role as a, as kind of a in terms of their function and task of of raising children. Is that right? And that you look at something else? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And I certainly wasn't the first to say that. You know, this idea of the functional mother, right? You know, how is she being measured by um, how her children? Are becoming. And, you know, in my own training, when I started to get curious about what was happening for her, and also more compassionate, I had a little bit more of a compassionate view, you know, I was even trained to sit in micro code, you know, on a videotape, these small interactions between mothers and children, like, you know, slow it down to see their level of gazing. And if the child is looking at the mom, or if she's given the right response. And it felt quite, it felt like a, a gaze that didn't feel comfortable. It didn't sit well with me. You know, there's almost that parallel to the male gaze yes. in looking at a woman's body. And so I remember wanting to just, you know, switch and think about her own subjectivity. And because I'm in clinical psychology, I really had to step out of the field to go into maybe probably more women's studies. Mm. But when I started to do in my own field, you know, to look for papers, it really was just absent. There was very little that wasn't tied to child outcome. And in fact, um, you know, our lab is even just finishing up this, like, you know, we have like thousands and thousands of journals across many fields that we're looking at. And it's the predominant way, you know, we measure a woman um, up, up against, you know, this child outcome research. So it's time to, you know, it's time to do the other half of the research. Yes, the child outcome research surely renders the mother only important and and of interest in relation to how that child actually you know ends up. Is it a successful child? Is it a functional child? Is this child a happy child? Is this? Or, I mean, I could go on, but you know, that's it's all in relation to that child rather than the mother's well being and the mother being you know a a critical <laughs> a critical point of reference and a person in her own right mm. yes yes good okay so I've got that good because I'm like to me it, it's obvious but why and let's let's try and unpack a bit why mothers are almost shrouded behind their children yeah I mean to 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 say that she's a person seems obvious and yet it's radical and that she has her own subjectivity just like we almost reminds me almost the parallel processes, you know, without making grand generalizations and comparison, but things like what we have in the United States around Black Lives Matter, right? This idea of humanizing, you know, individuals who are, you know, have their own personhood from the very dawn of existence. So why would our culture create sort of this idea of haves and have nots of who gets to be important and who gets to be looked at and who gets to have a voice. I mean, these are really deep, deep and old, entrenched 
uh, ideas. And so if we're going to talk about uh, mothers as women, I mean, we can look at just, you know, a history of sexism and, and you know, in the academe as well, that most of the models were based on male uh, developmental models. So that's also because men were the ones who were being educated, you know. So my, my, the first day of my class on matrescence, we often just go into the, the history of it. And we look at why they would form sort of the cornerstone of human development, right? Um, behind every human development theory, there is a mother who's driving that development. And why does the buck sort of stop there? Um, and you have to go back and think about, you know, who is being educated, who is writing the theories. And so you had to really come in, at least in the United States, into the mid-century and into the the women's movement when women were coming into, into academic positions and writing about their own lives. Um, once they had the power of the pen and to be able to describe themselves and their own experiences, then we started to irrigate with a whole other, you know, set of narratives. And I will say, you know, even if we go all the way back to Freud and psychoanalysis, where, you know, much of this began, I often sort of (laughs) um, think of him as a feminist in his own right, because he actually spoke to women, you know, where many women were being um, locked up and considered mad, you know, he gave, he talked to them. And, and he also, um, many of his uh, patients turned into psychoanalysts themselves. And through there, that line became women speaking and writing about their own experience. And, and, and that's where you start to hear some very interesting things. Yeah, I often look at the words that were uh, used in terms of uh, votes for women. And one of the, the famous papers was on uh, uh, something around "I'm a person too." It was a, it was a it was all about personhood and the right to vote. And and somehow motherhood hasn't it doesn't feel like it's quite caught up. It feels I'm quite happy to wildly generalise actually right now um, <laughs> because I feel like it. It feels like there's there's some this is a last bastion. This feels like one of the last bastions, which is motherhood as a place of struggle. And I mean, it's been a place of struggle, a site of struggle for years um, academically, but, and you know, it's been looked at, but I'm just, it's this personhood piece that I'm, I'm really fascinated by. And, um, and the question of why, why a culture would create something that where mothers don't, don't get to be people in their own right. You know, children being, First, children, you know, the, the kind of cult of childhood where you know, mothers at all cost, you know, mm. whether it's their lives, whether it's the, the children's rights, all sorts of things that have been to a move really right across towards children, which, of course, I have to temper with the fact that I'm not saying that children don't, shouldn't have that. But it's, it's just like women particularly get to get to so very easily disappear you know become invisible now your work of much since tell a bit tell us a bit more about what that means what what you mean sure and you know even from your previous statement i do want to maybe you know even now or later in the podcast talk about some of the changes you know i think becoming a mother was a given in society up until very recently so, you know, we've been, you know, right before we got on the podcast, we talked about this other theory of reproductive identity. You know, we just basically are starting to get into identity development models from the mid-century onward, where people can start exploring their identities around major areas of their selfhood, right? Their sexuality, their ability, their gender, Um, reproduction has always been sort of just given, um, it's an automatic thing that was thought of sort of heterosexual sex. It's what people did, you know, once they got married. And certainly it was a default status for women in particular, uh, whereas men sort of could opt out. And there was a lot of stigma for women. So there wasn't a lot of consciousness of the idea of sort of choice or of shaping uh, one's identity. It's either you became a mother or you were um, stigmatized, you know, poor you if you didn't. And, and now, you know, there's been so many other movements, the rise of individualism, you know, globalization, um, migration. We have so many pathways of becoming now 
that weren't available to us. So I think for the first time, the veils are lifting, as we see also, by the way, you know, reproduction is being delayed. More and more people around the world are either uh, delaying their parenthood or opting out altogether. Uh, Women, you know, the delayed entry into childbearing is a very real trend for most part of the world, you know, including the continent of Africa, which is said to sort of probably take on the same trends as well. Of course, you know, since the pandemic, we have new things to think about. And then, of course, you know, folks who were denied family building in the past, either because we didn't have the reproductive technologies, let's think of our aunts and grandmothers who infertility would have not allowed them uh, to have their family, or now we have surrogacy, LGBTQ families uh, creating their families in in, um, creative ways. So now we have this diversity of a landscape where people can participate in this thing called family. And of course, we're also disrupting this sort of, you know, what we thought was happening, like a nuclear family, you know, you know, again, I'll just talk stateside, you know, more than, you know, almost half of people also don't come from families that are traditional um, in their makeup. So I think, you know, people are getting real with what is the real status of families and, uh, (laughs) and women really sort of want to become others. So, you know, this is a good segue to talk about matrescence to just nest it if I, if I painted a good picture now of this, you know, diverse landscape, that matrescence, the, the transition to motherhood, is just one of those reproductive identities. Another type of reproductive identity is being childless by choice. Or, yes. And then even within matrescence, let's think about it, there are so many paths to motherhood, right? One can mm-hmm. do it smoothly or through a long and difficult journey. One can have one child or many. Uh, spread out or compressed, one may have lost their children along the way, you know, one may have adopted, one may have used their own genetic material or not. And so even through matrescence, there's this just beautiful individuality. And I think that's really at the core of matrescence when we talk about finding her person. What we can start talking about now is not just mother with a capital M having an experience, but, you know, orally having having an experience or Martha, you know, you know, a, a person who walks their reproductive path from the time that they come into it from from adolescence and see what happens. And so, you know, that's what I had discovered is that with talking to women directly through interviewing them, through working with them, that they have each such a unique story of how it happened to them. But there were a few universals. So I'll stop there and I can talk about that and what the theory of matrescence really might be shaping out to be. Before you do, what are the universals? Can you speak to those? Yeah, I think, you know, more and more I've been trying to figure out, you know, what is my own path in this space too, because we stand on the shoulders of a lot of people, right? And Mm -hmm. there are all these reproductive identity transitions that I described, depending on who you are in terms of all your other identities, what we call an intersectional lens based on your race, your gender, your income, all of these things. Many people have been writing about each of those like little sectors, those little pieces of the pie. So what I was trying to do is zoom back and try and say what would be the whole pie. So that's reproductive identity. And then if I were to take out one of the pies, which is the transition to motherhood, we start first with a work of Dana Raphael. So in the 70s, she's a medical anthropologist. She comes out of Columbia University. I actually know who her mentor was. Paul Mutas, he just passed away, unfortunately. Last year, he was at Teachers College as well. And um, I think she was pejoratively known at times as the tit lady. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, because she she studied um, breastfeeding and um, her book, The Tender Gift. And um, she coined the word doula as well. And of course, many of us who study this pink science, as it might have been called, probably were relegated to the margins. But, you know, her, she was probably most well known in midwifery circles and childbirth who were looking at the rite of passage of childbearing and birth and uh, linking it to other sorts of rites of passage um, out there. So I think that the, the universals are this idea that perhaps, like other stages of life, like adolescence or uh, death and dying um, and birth, that there are these hinges of life 
in which most cultures sort of try to shape the citizen who passed through it through some rites of passage to end up being, you know, fully realized into their society the way they see fit. And I, I say that specifically because when we talk about matrescence and the transition, we also want to always talk about location, geographic location and culture. Yes. Because it's going to be different, you know, depending on history, where you are in time and where you are in the world. So you know, I think that they sort of thought about it as more of a bodily experience, but I, I as a psychologist, been thinking about it much more as a biopsycho, social, spiritual, economic experience, meaning that if we say matrescence like adolescence, then it's a super holistic change, right? It's a 360 experience. It means our physiology will have some shifts including if you're not childbearing yourself, you might have gone through your own fertility story. The next would be your social standing, meaning um, how is your status? Are you looked upon differently? Your relationships, micro and macro, meaning your um, spousal relationships if you're in a partnership, meaning your peer relationships are all going to shift. I mean, you know, I know we all talk about, you know, those new mommy groups almost feeling like that day in high school where you have to make new friends, right? Yep. <laughs> uh, and you got to know which one, which of the moms, you know, do you feel like you're, you're gelling with? Mm -hmm. um, then you have um, your economic changes. Many women talk about sort of hitting a maternal wall in their work. And or you know changing their power status uh, in in the home, we have I call the spiritual dimension too or existential this bigger question not only of who am I, but what is the meaning and purpose in life? Yes, uh, we have awakenings of of justice like reproductive justice, the haves and have nots, uh, not only in health disparities but maybe in the world like. Now I watch a TV program with a child in a war zone that I might not live in, and that child is my child, and I cannot watch the violence anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and I now want to make change in my local and global communities. So this is a, sh a true shift, and when we, we talk about flux, I want to first call it a shift by saying there's you know this philosophical Greek term called metanoi, which is this idea of a whole mindset change. It's a real conversion experience. I would akin it to mm. just like a child becoming an adolescent. You know, the mind does not go back to its naive state, but it is also not a linear shift. It does. It's not a you know. It doesn't just happen straightforwardly, and it doesn't happen overnight. And if anything, there's a lot of maybe flux and, and flummox. <laughs> yes, that's a good word, flummox. <laughs> um, and, and a lot of suffering, you know, a lot of conflict, a lot of ambivalence, a lot of um, coexistence, maybe not warring all the time. I kind of try to soften the language. It's not either or I hate it or I love it. It's how do I sit with the tension of these opposite feelings of both feeling tremendously broken open. My heart is broke open. I feel joy and a love that is no longer conditional next to also the sense of feeling crippled would be the, the direct quote of one of my, one of my subjects, the most rewarding and crippling experience, you know, the, the times of, you know, real concrete physical deprivation coupled with also, you know, feelings of regret and all of those complexities. Mm -hmm. So how do I sit with that? And, and how does that deepen me as a human? And even more, and I'll kind of stop there, how do I sort of get there, get over to the next place? And what is the next place? How do I get from here to there? And who's there to support me? Am I totally isolated? Do I think it's just me and I'm going nuts? Did I get supported um, along the way, or did I get a framework to understand that it was probably quite normal to feel troubled by this time? So that's what I mean by the universals. So in short, and in summary, every person who goes through the transition to parenthood, I think will experience at some level a bio, psycho, social, existential, economic, spiritual change. And it, the time that it takes to sort of feel settled, you know, um, may also be a lifetime, may get re 
uh, awakened with each child. And also the pain points and growth points are different based on these individual differences. For example, when I work with a woman and I do an assessment, for some, it may have been the devastation of some kind of a, a physiological trauma that might have happened to them that really rocked them and broke them open to this conversion um, and awakened them. For another person, it might have been getting um, their, their trauma might be located in the workplace. So I hope that summarizes it. And of course, cultural specificity and competence would also let us think about, you know, the traditions that might either help or hinder this. And I'm always very, um, I always try to remember not to sort of romanticize any tradition in terms of how it, it seems to be helping a mother. Um, we have to be really critical thinkers and have our mothers themselves think about what are their real needs not what their um, family or society is telling them they, they should or shouldn't have available to them. Well, that's like, a, that's like an incredible double bluff, isn't it? That whole idea of, of critically thinking about what you actually need rather than what you've been kind of sold yep. that you need. So, and by the way, your son was incredible about the universals. I mean, that was more than, <laughs> more than okay. <laughs> that was, uh, it was a glorious you know, journey that you took us on there that really explained it. And so that one of the things that you said right at the, almost at the end there was about the, did I get supported? Did I, you know, did I, in a way, yeah, it's, what kind of support was there for me? How much do you see that, that this support issue really has impact in the experiences, either the experiences that we have or the way that we look at them? Mm. You know, you know, and this was actually in another interview too, that something got highlighted for me. The way I see it is the support is definitely the, the usual suspect. Mm -hmm. um, and it's in the literature too, you know, social support, if a, if a person doesn't have it, uh, nevertheless, a woman is a mother, you know, you're in trouble. Um, we also know that like, like any kind of mental illness, the minute a person starts isolating and become, you know, super introverted and stops reaching out for, for support, they're, you know, they're in trouble. It's probably a red flag. So I think, you know, just like we want to think about when we view a child, you know, who is holding the child, we really need to think about who's holding the mother. And my class is actually called, um, you know, Mother Child Matrix. So who's the, what is the matrix around her? And, and I think it's really a critical problem in a, in a rapidly sort of westernizing world, meaning and, and technologically driven or whatever you want to call it, a modern world where it's probably going to look something like the dispersion of kin. Your family's not likely going to be within arm's reach. If they are, the generations also might have different expectations. As we know, let's say um, the baby boomers over here uh, have unprecedented health gains than the previous generation. They're living longer. That means they might be retiring and having an active retirement life. Mm -hmm. So they may not be actively participating in, in helping you know, with grandchildren and all of that, then you have the high cost of childcare and so on and so forth. You're left really with um, families often, you know, depending where they are in the world, of course, we've got to locate that. So I'm, I'm very US centric right now, thinking about just how, how hard it is. It's just very, very hard without aloe mothers and without affordable um, family support around you to do this. Having said that, what I was kind of referencing from another podcast interview is that at the same time, you know, you hear the more traditional holding spaces. And when I talk to women, let's say doing the month in, in China or um, other practices where sometimes that also felt uh, too rigid as well, too pres the, it was too prescribed, you know, it was a one size fits all model, um, and of course, I'm making grand generalizations, but a lot of times tradition, you know, is going to be based on centuries of the way a culture might have been been doing its thing. And now, you know, we're in the modern context and we have access to how other people do things and so on and so forth. And maybe it's not so fun to have mom in law living with me um, <laughs> as long as it is. But boy, it really sucks when when she leaves, too. And um, what do I have to replace it? And do I have to be very wealthy? 
Um, or how do other communities, for example, who have maybe compressed generations, they're having their children closer together, they have multi-generations in, in living in one place, what are the benefits of that? So that's a long way of saying that now that we have sort of this rising individualism and we start to now figure out, what do I want? You know, there can be a really nice dialogue between what do I want and can sort of a la carte for myself, you know, versus what has tradition, traditional wisdom provided? And can there be a dialogue across those two things of either do it this way or don't have it at all? Yes. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's that intersection again, isn't it, of, of the individualism, let's say, with the grandparents and, and they're now potentially, potentially uh, living very active lives, expecting to travel or, or be unencumbered. The essence of being unencumbered, I think, is doesn't really matter what they do with it, just that, that they're not you know, in that space of caring for children or grandchildren. Versus that kind of conversation, well, it's not versus actually, it's all part of the conversation of, well, what do we each want? What stages are we at? What do we want now? Rather than the tradition of, well, you know, you go from being a mother yourself to grandmotherhood, in fact, you, you then take the caring role of that on once your children have grown and had their children, because it's all in the, through the lens of care, care of others. And now that's that's completely disrupted, isn't it? And again, I, I agree with you. You know, it, it depends in, you know, the the geographical location, the culture. But, but for many of us in a westernising world, yeah, I mean, it, women are looking round, going, oh, where, where is everyone? Where is anyone? You know, this is a a massively individual experience and a hugely isolating one, and. I don't have the answers. So where are the answers? Yeah. No, but I, if I may say, if we can take a pause and say, and it just hit me too, right? You know, like you said, the dutiful grandmother, you know, the dutiful mother, you know, all of this narrative being disrupted, you know, this is definitely new and how matrescence is grandmatrescence too, yes, right? Yes, it, it's, exactly. It, it's going. Now, what, what I think your audience should really know is that we are in one of the most phenomenal social shifts of humanity because of reproduct because of these reproductive shifts. So you have on the one hand, never before in the history of mankind are um, women having less than three children. So the reproductive drops never seen before. The dispersion of kin, like you're saying, where the let's say the the grandmother is not participating. Uh, there was I'm going to butcher this, but there was an article a couple years ago that I thought was just groundbreaking. It was a woman paleoanthropologist, I think, mm -hmm. who actually said that the survival of the species was due to grandmothers who was able, who were able to either, I don't know if they were digging for the tubers uh, while the mothers were taking care of their children, or uh, they were taking care of this, the first child and, uh, or the second child so that the mothers could do that, that they were really critical in this connection. So the second thing that we've never seen before is this uh, sort of social fabric. And then on top of it, we have, um, you know, these kind of larger social structures that have really, um, you know, fallen apart. So never before, we may not have the answers, but I want to let your audience know that this generation is not only facing new, new things <laughs> for its own generation and, and before, but it's almost doing it for humanity at large. It is truly a, a massive historic shift. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> it's, it's, it feels obvious too, but it's, but it's what I really love is that you're naming it so very clearly. And that's, that's because it, feels groundbreaking. It feels, I imagine that most generations feel like something is groundbreaking, yet this actually is historic, isn't it? It, it, it never has it been like this. And, and that's, that's the thing. So I, I, that's why we're um, so, so many women and actually grandmothers and, you know, women who haven't got children have voluntarily not wanted to or would love them. All these different identities. It's, it's a fascinating area. Such opportunities. I love talking about this. So take, take us on to 
reproductive identity because which is really what you've what you've obviously been talking about the dispelling of the myth that there's one pathway yeah yeah you got it I mean, that's exactly what it's exactly what you've really been talking about as you've taken us through this last piece which is why would we ever imagine that there was ever one pathway i mean i realize why we did but i mean when did when did this start kind of unraveling the one pathway piece when did that for you personally when did you at what point in your own life i'm curious actually Hmm. you know it it seems to be like any kind of consciousness raising you have these levels of of conscious awakenings and awarenesses i think it first began actually and i've always been interested in women's lifespan development happened to be around reproductive cancers where it first started and seeing um, and listening and reading about women's survival stories and how they were all sort of coming to these universal questions, but doing it very differently depending on who they were. So I think I heard the, the deeper register, I guess, of women's voices, you know, when you just hear their their wails, you know, to existence, you know, who am I? Why am I here? What was the whole point of this thing? And and we often do that sort of dance at the end of life, don't we? You know, this reevaluation and reprioritizing and thinking about ourselves as individuals and were we shaped by our circumstances or did we have a hand of any kind of agency in them? Yes. And you know, did our bodies betray us? Um, did our medical field, did our gender say something about who we are? So I, th- I think that was really what cracked me open to these stories. And and from there, you know, pulling back with my own mentor at the time, thinking about whether that happened, not only the way out of life, but welcoming life in. During that time, though, it was very stigmatizing, even psychology, to talk about this more existential and spiritual condition you know, this was sort of relegated to the to the religious life. So when that started to get a little bit more mainstream with the increase of the wellness movement as well, ma- mainstreaming, you know, I used to have to say I studied spiritual development under my breath, you know, at cocktail parties. <laughs> oh, God. Oh. <laughs> you know, uh, even though we studied, you know, cognitive development and all these other kinds of things in humans, we didn't really ever talk about sort of these... Uh, people talking about also having some kind of like uncanny experiences, right? You know, climbing the top of the mountain and feeling unified with all of nature and the difference between me and the other dropping and um, a sense of um, love pervasing, pervading everything, you know, these kind of really big oh. um, things that we hoped, you know, people often talked about when they had maybe like um, an epiphany, you know, spiritual epiphany, but more and more people were talking about that you know, doing, um, listening to a good jazz concert or going for walks in nature, it seemed that more of the public was talking about, I guess, you know, now what we call positive psychology and the growth potential movement, right? The human potential movement of wellness, you know, not only talking about what things that feel terrible, but how do I increase my character strengths and my grit and my uh, patience and, you know, all of these things that we actually now know are tied to success. And now we even want them in our schools, like mindfulness meditations and being present. And, you know, the whole zeitgeist has changed, frankly. Mm. And when we talk about the human potential movement, um, then we can marry it to also the Me Too movement of women also talking about, you know, having enough and not being silenced by their own um, oppressive experiences. And now we have this entitlement in a way, you know, I mean, in the best sense, that we have the right, the human right to, to fulfill our potential and to call out whether it's systemic issues or one-on-one people who um, are, are doing us wrong. So, you know, I think that's the landscape that made available also the next thing that I'm going to say to tie it in, which is that people were, you know, starting to map out adolescence and then they were starting to kind of do death and dying. And then there was like a cliff (laughs) right after adolescence. There was like no adult development models. You know, it seemed like you just, okay, so you, now we're finding how to optimally raise children and get them everything that they need. But then what do you, do you just freeze in place once you become an adult? 
um, is, is the growing done and over? And of course, that literature started to improve through like Jeffrey Arnett's work on emerging adulthood, knowing that actually now you don't even get to go immediately into adulthood. You're in emerging adulthood in your 20s. And of course, if the economy doesn't even give you a job, you're probably going to land back living with your parents. <laughs> and, uh, and now you can date like you're shopping. And so there's infinite choice and um, so on and so forth. And you might not even partner up uh, until much later in life. And, you know, the whole ball of wax rolls in this way. So, you know, he had a call to papers in the American Psychologist about, you know, we are in this new time, and this was pre, pre-COVID, of we are lacking adult development models, you know, do we grow and and how and and also in this sort of human potential movement, does what adulthood look like change? Is it different in this next hundred years? So I thought that was a really compelling question. And of course I'd been, you know, working on, you know, this motherhood thing all along. And I always didn't really it didn't really sit very, very well with me how overly gendered it was. I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of it. I, I, even in my class, I say, you know, some people turn women's studies departments into gender studies departments. There's a rationale for either of those, but until we understand matrescence better, I will make it um, in a, a story about those who identify as women in their transition, because we just need to fill this gap. It's just not there. And once we fill the gap, then we can open it up to all folks um, who are considering mobilizing their reproductive potential, which is a really fancy word of just saying, let's talk about your reproductive life as a potential, not a given, and how would you mobilize it? So as I started to talk about that, I did not feel comfortable not being able to invite everybody to the table because there are just as many kids, you know, growing up who are, don't, you know, don't relate to a heteronormative path at all, you know, Mm -hmm. um, who are coming into their own sexualities. We have now, thank goodness, this generation's understanding of more fluidity, even in all of these things, you know, they're not categorical, they're not either or, they can shift, you know, throughout our lifetime. And so that made me sort of get very open-ended and think about reproductive identity as this really big table we can all sit at and of course play musical chairs and as well because (laughs) you know uh how we come into our reproductive pathway may not be how we end up and of course um I'll, i'll end here which is to say you know i also talked to lots of people and you know let's let's take the story of someone who's going to a child's birthday party but has uh, experienced many miscarriages but has not disclosed their status and um, they may or may not be invited or it might be uncomfortable because they don't have kids and the way that we sort of look at each other over these invisible fences but we have no real idea internally how people self-identify um, someone with a child may actually feel more internally not yet like a parent and feel more like their and you know independent selves and someone without a child and i remember actually in one of the conferences uh that you and i talked about someone had uh, come to me and she had just spoken about her infertility journey and had she was a performance artist and had laid out all of the medications and had done everything all up until deciding to adopt and she it was a conference on motherhood and she asked me, do I belong here? Mm. And I thought that was extremely poignant. And I said, of course, you know, does having a physical child make you internally feel like internally uh, a mother? So that's our subjectivity. And, and that when we, that is our inalienable right to self-identify however we see fit. Our experiences are complex. We may have um, long, devastating, or uplifting stories of our reproductive expression. And in the end, no one should tell us who we are in that space. So to me, it was the natural next line and extension beyond the work of reproductive choice, which often fits in one sort of paradigm. And I'm delighted to sit on the framework of reproductive justice in which reproductive identity sits on top of it. But when you marry identity with reproduction, then you get to tell this story of who am I 
And that's, I think, the most powerful story of all. Mm. I'm almost speechless at the profound gift that you, in this conversation, actually, that you've kind of rendered here. Because what you've done is, I uh, certainly feel it as I listen to you, is this cracking open of this idea about, you know, that, that idea of the pathway, the self-identity, how you feel inside, who you see yourself as, that physical child doesn't denote and doesn't, you know, doesn't fix any kind of identity. It doesn't have to be that way. And we're not taught that. We're not, you know, that conversation, this, this conversation that we're having isn't a normal conversation, basically. <laughs> that's just, that's from where I am. It's like, that's just not the average conversation. The average conversation, and I, I realize it's, you know, located where I am at the moment in my generation, et cetera. But the fact is the typical, the typical conversation in media in that I'm exposed to would be, well, once you, once you have a child, that's it. Once you've decided not to, you take on this role, this identity, but it's not the way it is. And that's what's so important and why I wanted us to have this conversation. The very, the very point that you made, does having a physical child make you feel like a mother? Yeah. Mm, thank you. Does it make you feel like a mother? I mean, for goodness sake, if only so many women could hear that and, and actually people could hear that, human beings, maybe there'd be so much more forgiveness and less, more acceptance of self, more playful exploration of self what that means i am so grateful to you that we could have this conversation i really am and listeners i'm going to make sure that orly's kind of ways to find our work your work uh, are all in the show notes and yeah i'm profoundly thankful well thank you to you as well because it takes conversations like these to disseminate them so people can hear them, that they can have these conversations. And my hope to your audience is have these types of conversations and maybe we can do them earlier. I know one of my, some of the work that I'm doing in, uh, is around getting this even earlier and earlier, um, even into sexual health education classes, let's say in schools, just like we have teens and older thinking about what kind of careers they want to have or um, all of these other kind of we normalize a lot of these conversations. What would it look like if we normalized about whether I want to have a family or not, or how do I feel about it, um, my own experiences being in a family so far? And who do I think I can be in this space? And who have I been told I can be? I mean, that's just, that's just good conversation. And I th think it can happen in developmentally appropriate ways throughout the lifespan. So thank you for this conversation and for bringing it to the ears of your large audience. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode, and I really hope you did, I'd love to hear from you. You can leave a rating and a review over on Apple Podcasts or email me on hello at schoolformothers.com. That's hello at schoolformothers.com. Well, that's all for now, listeners. Thanks so much for tuning in. Have a fantastic week. And of course, stay safe. Sending you lots of love. Thank you for tuning in to the School for Mothers podcast. To continue the conversation and keep your dose of inspiration up, head over to schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast, where you'll find bonus content from Danusha and her guests on habits, recommendations, books, best apps, time-saving secrets, life hacks, health, sleep and anything in between. That's schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast. 